Okay, here's the first question. What are the signs to look out for in someone who's hurting inside and might resort to suicide? I think you already answered that one in the session. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. Just to, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, repeat myself or, you know, just to address it personally since you asked. And uh, that is um, people, uh, as we saw, become withdrawn. Either they sleep too much or sleep not at all. Um, probably they are not taking care of themselves. Their performance is dropping, depending on the age group. And their appetite, they are not able to eat or sometimes they eat too much. And they're talking about suicide, they're researching suicide, and they're really wanting to know how people end their lives. Um, and they are walking alone, lost in their thoughts, or sometimes, like we said, they may be cutting self, self-harm, and therefore that could be seen certainly as an indicator of the deeply hurting, if not wanting to commit suicide. Thank you, Uncle. I think this calls for us to be more attentive to everybody who's around us so that we might pick up on these things. Here's the next one. Do you think suicide is a selfish decision as it affects everyone around them way more than it affects them, especially after one successfully does it? Yeah, it is sad. It is sad that um, not only the person who is committing suicide is losing a great opportunity that God has created that person with and not able to live their full life and contribute richly to their own life and to others' lives. But it is also leaving the family and friends in deep shock and shame and guilt. It is true. But is it a selfish decision? Are we judging this person? Are we able to solve anybody's um, problem by passing a judgment and saying, is it a selfish decision? Now, suppose somebody were to contemplate or thinking of suicide, and we are not even in conversation with this person. Let's say a person in this group. And if we say, well, this person, if he's committing suicide is very selfish, it is only adding to the pain of that person rather than resolving their issue. So therefore, I believe, you know, just as life preservation is a very, very personal matter, life annihilation is also a very personal matter. Take it outside the context of suicide. Euthanasia, for example, is a big debate. Why do you want to commit suicide? Or why do you want to end life? Because of extreme, um, you know, illness, unbearable pain and burden on the family, etc. So let us not say that it is a selfish decision. No, like I said, nobody wants to end their life. Our default setting is to enjoy life, live life. And if somebody is wanting to end life, it's not a selfish um, decision, but a totally helpless decision. Yes, Uncle. Thank you for putting it that way. So here's the third one. You said uh, suicide is a conscious act. So if it is a conscious act, then how do we respond to the acts of suicide that are done under the influence of alcohol or other substances? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, it is not that when a person is under the influence of alcohol, um, he's not aware. Like, say, for example, if they are sloshed out, I can imagine they don't remember what they say. They don't remember, you know, how they behave. But in the, in the first instance, when they resorted to alcohol, many times they are aggressive towards people, but not actually committing suicide, right? When people consume alcohol, all those suppressed emotions which they were not able to express for lack of courage and strength, they suddenly feel a very artificial courage and strength and try to be violent, try to fight with people, uh, double their size, 
and say stuff they were never wanted to, were never able to say it because they get a false sense of superiority, right? That is what happens in, uh, um, under the influence of alcohol. But very rarely people actually consume alcohol and go jump in front of a train, right? So that rarely happens. So in that sense, I believe um, uh, suicide is more of a conscious act than an unconscious act. Thank you, Uncle. Here's the next one. What about abetment to suicide? Isn't it something which is real? Uh, I'm afraid uh, if that comes to the light of the authorities, that person is, you know, open to be prosecuted. Right? If I help anybody to commit suicide, it is not a wise thing to do. It is not a legal thing to do. It must never be done. We must help a person to stop, overcome, and not commit suicide. But there should be no abetment to suicide by anyone. And uh, uh, yes, I mean, for lack of time, look at uh, what David did uh, to the servant who assisted uh, King Saul to die, you know? How dare you do that, right? No, we must not do that. Thank you, Uncle. Here's the next one. Uh, suicide as a means of attention seeking. Uh, what are your thoughts? Especially seeking attention from an absent parent or friends or significant other. Yeah. Uh, um, suicide or an att attempt at suicide must be taken seriously, especially when it is seeking attention from the absentee parent or the parent present or the friends or anybody who is in the picture. Never wish it away, never poo-poo it and said, come on, grow up, don't do this, you know, grow mature, take life, take responsibility, don't do that. Get to the bottom of what is hurting. Get to the bottom of what is driven that person to attempt suicide. Yes. It is actually a window of opportunity for all caregivers to take those signs as an opportunity to save that person. Here's the next one. What is the best way to help someone who is constantly depressed and suicidal? How to react in such situations? Yeah, um, I'll just uh, share a slide. For want of time, I had not gone further down, but. I'll just share a slide and then I'll respond to your the question. Oops. Okay. Whenever, whenever um, a person is depressed for longer durations, has a history of attempting suicide, don't take it lightly. If you're not trained for it, if you do not have the competency to address their problems, you must refer them, help them to seek help. So. At the first level, inform the caregivers. Inform the caregivers, particularly parents. And then if it is Sunday school, the teachers, the superintendent, the pastor, the elders, because it's a matter of life and death. And if it is in hostels, the wardens. If it is in schools, the principal or the superintendent. Or definitely, if it is in a, in a social setting, encourage them to seek professional help. It could start with psychiatrists, psychologists, or start at least with counselors if they feel, um, you know, there's a inhibition or a stigma attached to this whole thing, and they don't want to go to a psychiatrist or psychologist. At least let's start them with counselors so that they can convince them to seek professional interventions where psychiatrists is authorized to prescribe medication, Psychologists can address deeper psychological issues and counselors' day-to-day -day matters. So 
Let nobody take it lightly. And yes, you have an opportunity to save this life. Uh, encourage them to seek help appropriately. Thank you. Here's the next one. You're saying live-in relationships are toxic. What about toxic marriages that make people suicide? Yeah, my apologies. <laughs> I'm not saying all live-in relationships are toxic. I didn't say that. I take back if I've said it. But I believe the nature of our current society and the community is such that live-in relationship is a reaction to a failed marriage, let's say. Now, if a marriage that has a social sanction, if a marriage that has probably had spiritual roots and foundation and still has, and if somehow the two married people are not able to live a, a, a successful marriage and showcase it as a good institution for children, and a youngster goes and has uh, um, uh, enters into a live-in relationship as a reaction. Now, I believe with all the lack of that social support, spiritual support, community support, live-in relationships are very vulnerable. And one person of the live-in relationship, usually the guy, is prone to take undue advantage of all the social checks and balances and safety measures. And therefore, there's a high degree for toxicity in the relationships. Now, I agree with this person who has asked the question that there are toxic marriages in so-called uh, you know, societal marriages sanctioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, by the society. There is toxicity. We need to address that as well. And therefore, my challenge is that if the toxicity in regular marriages is addressed, there will be a less of a reaction to go and live, have live in relationships. So I encourage the people who are in a place of influence to address the toxicity in regular marriages. And I encourage youngsters not to act reactively and get into live-in relationships without any social sanctions or support systems. Thank you. Uh, here's the next one. Um, is self-harming a manipulative behavior? Another question related to that. How do we deal with emotionally abusive people, that is parents, kids, and significant others, who threaten to commit suicide as a way of getting their way? It's an emotional trap, but the fear is that they might actually do it and we would be blamed for it. Yes. Um, I believe, yes, there are some people who can take advantage of, uh, you know, uh, especially helpless parents and, you know, caregivers that if you don't give me, I will commit suicide. Now, um, I believe that it differs from case to case. What is it that the person is demanding? And what is it that the parents have to give and stuff like that? Now, uh, it could be in a marriage relationship that if you don't accept this marriage, then I will go and commit suicide. If you don't buy, buy me this car or this expensive bike, I'll go and commit suicide. Uh, if you don't allow me to go to so-and-so country and study, I'll commit suicide. You know, much of it is to do with either our family or social prestige or the finances at stake. These are the things that people manipulate. In other words, in other words, children have carefully studied the psychology of the parents and the caregivers, and they say they will, you know, bend if we attack this area, family prestige. They will bow down, yield, if they are, you know, forced to buy this or do this. Now, 
um, people who threaten like this, they could do that. But I believe that we need to take a call on a case by case basis. But usually, let me say this, the, the things have come to such a head because the parents have been giving in in the past for such emotional manipulations. So now they've started using ending life. So therefore, it is something that is built over a period of time, right? Uh, so um, we need to take a balanced view. I don't want to say give in or don't give in because there is no clear answer to it. And it is dangerous for me to say that um, because lives are at stake. It has to be done case by case. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, quite a few more questions and we're running short of time, so maybe we keep it in a shorter period. Here's the next one. Uh, horrific news about junior college students committing suicide recently. Since the suicide was driven by terrible pressure put on the children from the management side, is it still a suicide or does it become murder? Yeah, sorry, last part. If it... um, because, uh, because since the suicide was driven by the terrible pressure put on the children from the management side, is it still a suicide or does it become murder? Oh, now, who is actually putting the stu students in those such schools and colleges? It is parents. So parents are just knowing that these people resort to this kind of absolutely terrible terrible ways of uh, pushing students to perform. And see, people who have a capacity to perform, have that zeal to perform and uh, ability and motivation to perform, they don't struggle. But it is actually the people who are average and below average students who are put into these IIT classes or extremely competitive uh, groups, they suffer. Why? Because the management is just trying to achieve what the parents want and after knowing it is impossible. So is it a murder? Now, if it is a murder, is it who are the primarily responsible people? Is it the college staff or is it the parents? We need to really, really take a hard look at it. So I hope that uh, helps you to think through and not an answer per se. Here's the next one. I grew up in a broken family. I have seen my parents fight constantly. My father and his family are emotionally abusive. This has given suicidal thoughts to my mom and me. What do we do? I'm sorry. I'm really sorry whoever has asked this question that you are in such a situation. My heart goes out for you that uh, somehow, uh, let me use the word very carefully, this whole business of patriarchy um, and entitlement of being a man and wanting to um, suppress, um, manipulate and uh, dominate and even be violent in the name of uh, values, tradition, scripture, etc. That is wrong. If somebody is emotionally abusive, physically abusive, financially abusive, needs to be called out and addressed. Instead of attempting suicide, instead of entertaining thoughts about suicide, you need to channelize your energies to take a stand, to assert yourself, and to be able to face these um, uh, abusive behaviors and deal with them. Channelize your energies, not towards uh, taking your life, but to assert yourself and your stand. And seek help from like-minded leaders and you know, people who can help you. So whoever has asked that question, if you're still here in the meeting, if you'd like us to connect you with some counselors or somebody that might be able to help you, do reach out. Uncle, here's the next question. Do self-harming or self-destruction thoughts lead to suicide? Why do I feel better after self-injury? Well, I'm not doing it recently, but I'm scared that I might attempt it again in the future. Right. At one level, self-harm works as a distraction. That is, I have psychological pain, 
And my mind is constantly on a shuffle, thinking about the same thing, feeling about it, and the pain going on and on. And when you cut yourself, harm yourself, you are getting a distraction. And sometimes this pain numbs the other pain. And therefore, you feel a false sense of, ah, I feel better. So that is not something that you need to resort to, but go to the root of the problem, not find a distraction in self-harm. That's the next one. Does getting psychological help or treatment have a stigma associated with it? If so, why do you think getting help to deal with suicidal feelings has a stigma? As a stigma. Now, again, a lot of people, uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, influences, I must say, whether it is the priests, whether it is the parents or the community, whatever, you know, people have over a period of time have definitely attached stigma to suicide. Now, that's a real fact. But today, let us see. How is the situation, especially after COVID? You know, a majority of the people are happy to seek help for their mental well-being, mental health. And not much of stigma is associated when you are reaching out for that kind of help. But, however, I must say that when it comes to suicide, definitely somebody attempts suicide, definitely uh, people attach stigma to it. But, however, However, you know, I ask this simple question. When you have a headache, you take a tablet. When you have an emotional pain, what do you take? Now, I believe that when we do not address this question, we push people to suicide. When we have emotional pain, if you have a friend to talk to, a counselor to talk to, a caring person to talk to, then you will not be pushed towards suicide. And there need not be any uh, crisis there. But today we must accept that it is okay to talk. It is okay to say, I have health issues as much, I, I have uh, emotional issues as much as I could have health issues that I go to a doctor to. So when you have emotional problems, when you want to talk, seek out, a counselor or a caring friend or anybody who will be able to give you competent help. And don't worry about anybody thinking, attaching any stigma to it. I believe today we have come a long way and people are accepting that it is a good step to seek help when you have emotional problems. This next question is related to that uh, story you were telling us about Victor Frankl. So maybe you'll understand it better. However, Viktor Frankl does not get to live such thoughts after surviving Auschwitz. Do you think a broken expectation can also be a setback? Yes. I mean, the, the, the case in point that I cited shows the power of thought. It is true that life after Auschwitz may not have you know, help. It could be a broken expectation. Good call. But the thing is, the power of thought is nevertheless uh, cannot be undermined. You, you have the power of thought where, you know, you hold on to it and you can and your body, your entire system um, falls in line with that thought. Your energies are channelized towards that thought and you're able to achieve uh, your goal and purpose. And your immune system develops, I'm sorry, improves when you have those kind of positive, hopeful thoughts. A merry heart is like a medicine. All right. So merry heart happens when I have better thoughts, a good chance of doing it. And if you have God in your faith equation, Christ in your faith equation, it is definitely a winner. So let's not undermine the power of thought. A thought that is consecrated by God is even more powerful. 
This one. Uh, what do you think about people who tried attempting suicide but did not succeed? That later they feel isolated or free. How do we help them? Yes, we should not. I mean, it is true that people tend to isolate. I think let us be fair to people who isolate, touch people who have attempted suicide. Perhaps those who isolate them are they didn't they don't know how to uh, relate to such people ignorance they were they're uh, um, probably feeling out of their depths oh my god you know what if i relate and that person continues to do it will it reflect on me right so let us be kind to these people who are moving away and therefore let us build everyone to say that it is all right it is all right to relate to such people encourage them draw them into a meaningful relationships and community and support them and create help and hope and offer worth uh, to such people. It's okay. Thanks, Dr. Here's the next one. Some people appear very social and always appear with a smiling face, but instead they are suffering and they are probably considering suicide. How can we identify those people? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, this has been uh, raking the minds of people, the caregivers, the psychologists, and all these people. And especially in institutions, you hear this phrase often, we had no inkling, uh, inkling that this person was going to commit suicide. She was so cheerful, so intelligent, etc. Now, again, it is an Asian um, phenomena where we are asked to put up a front no matter what is going on inside. We are asked to be appearing cheerful. We are asked to be appearing spiritual. We are asked to be appearing successful. We are asked to put on a facade and live a lie. And some people actually fall for it and say, life is all about living a lie. And suddenly, when they cannot cope it for too long, they commit suicide. Or when the reality comes out behind, from behind the facade and I'm exposed, again, it's an Asian concept, loss of faith. And the people commit suicide. And some pe such people, some of them commit suicide because not a real exposure, but fear of exposure. What if people know this is who I am truly? Where all along I've been pushed to live a lie. And today we need to really, really become very conscious of this, even in our you know, communities where authenticity should be celebrated. Just like David in the Bible just came clean for who he was, never hiding anything and coming through and seeking help. Thank you so much, Michael. I think especially in this world of social media, we find it very difficult to because everybody is masked behind their happy smiling photos and uh, yeah. Um, Uncle, this is the last question for tonight. It says, uh, why does the Christian community in India have a higher rate of suicide when compared to other countries? Yeah, exactly the same reason I said earlier, and that is. Um, you know, we are held to higher standards. We are held to shaming and feeling shamed when we fail. And we have never understood, maybe intellectually we may have understood grace, but we've never learned to extend grace to people who are struggling. Grace is the greatest gift of Christian faith. Yet it is a tragic casualty in our day-to-day -day conversations. We are so critical. We are so judgmental, so rejecting of people who cannot come up to spiritual standards. And that we need to stop and extend grace, grace, and grace. And I believe that is the answer, not only for the church, but also for the entire world. 
my grace is sufficient for you. And we should be the channels of such grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Are we abounding that grace in our relationships? That, I believe, is a sure hope for anyone who's struggling with suicidal thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think there's somebody in the audience who wants to uh, uh, ask a question. Maybe we can unmute them. You can unmute yourself, uh, whoever it is. I'm not sure. What it is. Yeah, Navi, thank you. This is Suresh. So thank you so much for your uh, fantastic uh, lesson. It was very useful and helpful. And uh, we're able to experience, I mean, your experience really changes many lives. So now uh, you gave some practical uh, tips on uh, suicide. You know, that goes even for the youth, especially boys, when you said. So th there are some symptoms. See, uh, you sleep more. But again, uh, they don't. you said that they don't care about uh, their hygiene or cleanliness. Nothing like that. He, he is very kind of hygiene and he really dressed well and goes out. And I'm confused actually. Sometimes he'll be like really well behaved, uh, very obedient and things like that. And sometimes again, uh, totally contracts. And uh, maybe he's, he's kind of 18 now. I'm confused about his behavior. And uh, see, we are, we are, I mean, both me and my wife, we say that. We, we we are there to accept you as you are and we don't mind even if you go wrong mistake tell us communicate to us we are there to help you honestly saying that we don't know how to raise this generation and we can't relate to your generation and uh, we are kind of and regularly we also have discussions when we have discussion bibles in the evenings and he really goes out with a lot of insights and he brings out a lot of uh, ideas from the scriptures but uh, and also he's very confident about life even without education i can survive and i can do life but i'm scary scared about uh, i mean uh, about his life and career and about reality in the future because i mean he has not seen the life that's what my thought goes on but he's very confident confident in his life that i have planned i know what to do things like that so don't know how to handle him or understand him sir yeah i know i mean uh, it is more than a question, but a scenario for addressing it as a, a case for counseling. But I can sense that as a father, um, you're really concerned for your son um, in terms of not being able to understand the vagaries of his personality. At one moment, he is, uh, uh, you know, sounds very confident. At other times, he doesn't seem to be very confident. Uh, what exactly? You know, is he up to? He says, I don't have to study and I'll be successful. And you know that it is so difficult if you don't, one doesn't study well. Um, so you're struggling. I think um, there is uh, two, two issues, one with your son and also one with yourself as to how do I deal with this anxiety, this fear for my son uh, as to how he will fare. Uh, I would say that uh, if you would be kind enough to talk to somebody to deal with it. And uh, I would say um, you can better relate with son, your son. And I just want to give you two tips. And that is affirm him in all the good that he, like you said, he comes out with great insights in the Bible study. Affirm him whenever you see good. And whenever there is a matter for concern, uh, let's let's say better, I, I'm concerned about this. I'm praying. Should you need to talk about it with me or with somebody else, please do, but uh, do not just suffer silently. Um, always keep those communication channels open, and uh, that will be a great uh, uh, step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Okay, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uncle. Uh, please, thank you so much for coming and giving us so many insights. This is one topic that I think a lot of us feel scared to even approach because it's a matter of life. So thank you for your uh, really uh, insightful thoughts about this. Mm -hmm.